come August 2022, every scandal that William Buto has, that Raila Odinga has, is what will be visited upon you mm. every time. If you know Raila Odinga, you know what to expect. <laughs> if you know where Western Hotel is, you know what to expect. Did you listen to the hot breakfast this morning? Here's what you missed. You know the subject of the week uh, since Friday, uh, the announcement of the death of Kenya's third president, Mwai Kibaki, and the body's been lying in state the last three days. Today's the last day. Mm -hmm. uh, official no, tomorrow is the last day. day. Today. Is it today or tomorrow? What happens? T tomorrow, I think, will be a break day, and then Friday night's Nyayo. official uh, Nyayo, uh, yeah. stadium yeah. funeral. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So, your thoughts on the man? I mean... We've heard all kinds of things, um, you know, from when he started politics to when he was uh, Minister of Finance, the uh, Vice President, uh, left Kanu, started DP. We've heard all of that. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a man with a checkered history, and it depends on how you want to, to look at him. And uh, the argument I have with everybody, if you want to understand how who, who Mikey Bwaki was, you've got to look at 2007. Yes. Uh, 2007, whereas people say that he was the most popular and best president, he nearly lost that election. And by some accounts, some say that he did lose. And that tells you that 50% plus one of the electorate did not think that he was a good leader. And that's really Mikey Bwaki's history. Uh, for a lot of the time simply because uh, you know he's not considered as one of the fighters for the second liberation mm -hmm. and this is the only dot that you will find in his uh, resume among others that that in 1992 he w he resigned last minute he is famously known for saying that uh, trying to destroy Kanu is like trying to cut a mugumo tree with with a razor so his his history in that regard is checkered but his history as an economist and his his, uh, his work at the helm of the finance ministry in the 1970s where he grew the GDP of this country uh, through the 60s and 70s at 7% uh, every every year uh, is, is, is a big deal. When you look at uh, how he changed the economy of Kenya uh, between 2002 all the way to 2013 is a big deal. He's the only president on record by the who grew our economy beyond 10% uh, per annum which, which, which was a big deal. This was uh, in uh, just after the uh, promulgation of the constitution. So he is a man with a checkered past. He has done a lot of great things, but there are also things in his life that 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 uh, uh, have questions and I think it's only fair to his memory to remember him accurately, uh, not to uh, say that the dead make no mistakes. I think Kibaki grew or became what you would call a politician uh, et passe by, you know, getting hard hit by the policies of Kanu back then. But when he became himself, I mean, you have to go way back when he was MP for a place called Don Home. Do you know mm -hmm. Don Home? Oh, yeah. yeah. And okay. then Bahati. It is yes. yeah. And then to Odaya. But, you know, I've been reminiscing something, guys. Uh, when Kibaki was taking the reins of power, and this is something that I said uh, this week, when he was taking the reins of power, we all knew he was not 100%. He was quite sickly. And his second term, actually, things got worse. So, Nick, think about this. What if Kibaki took the reins of power when he was 100%, the Kibaki of the 90s? What more could he have done, Mark Bichachi? What more could this country have become? You know, the question you're asking is, is quite interesting because the argument has been had that Kibaki was actually a spoiler for Matiba in 1992. And I'm sorry for playing devil's advocate because I am not an African liberal. <laughs> but, you know, we've got to look at the man in context. So, 1992, when he left Kanu, of course, that billed him as, as the de facto, uh, one of the leaders of Mount Kenya one of the people who actually uh, clamored for change uh, of the constitution uh, through uh, uh, Ufungamano initiative. Uh, he did quite a bit in terms of building the democratic space of post-1992. But some people have argued that he was still working for Kanu in 1992 and it's only 1997 when he could smell uh, the presidency that he became the democrat that we know. But now you see th the problem is you've got to differentiate between the politics of the day 
Kibe and the leader that Mwai Kibaki was. In terms of Mwai Kibaki's leadership, post-2002, you've got two questions. Number one, did his illness uh, then bring to the fore uh, the, the mistakes that we saw? And the mistakes post-2002 are quite a number. Number one, we squandered an opportunity to kill corruption forever in this country. That's one of the biggest losses that we had in 2002. You can blame it on his sickness, you can blame it on a number of things, but at the end of the day, he squandered a lot of political goodwill to end corruption in this country. Number two, there was the very big issue of tribalism uh, in this in this country. That 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 twice uh, the two handshakes that he had, one with uh, Rainbow in 2002, when he coalesced a coalition of different uh, tribes, and make no mistake, it was a coalition of tribes. It is that unity that won him the election in 2002, and it's the handshake with the other. You remember it was 43 versus one. Mm -hmm. Uh, you well, know, this is one. It is that handshake that brought again unity to this country. So he has again a history of bringing uh, peaceful uh, existence into this country. But then again, you've got to look at the other side. When he received the reports that there could be probably tribal clashes uh, post the elections 2007, did he take enough initiative to stop it? So it's 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 a checkered past. I want to be very real to the history and and the memory of a man I deeply respect, and I think it's only the honourable thing to talk. About about his good, his bad, and none of his problems. Oh, granted, granted, <laughs> Mark, granted, Mark, but you have to remember the checkered past that you're talking about, mm. and they even the conglomerate of uh, people who came in in, 20, in 2002 after they, you know, they, they uh, removed uh, Kanu from power. Mm. You have to remember it wasn't Kibaki alone. The fact that we all agree that he was sickly at that particular point, he needed much help from the people he trusted. And probably, Mark, they never lived. You know, they never lived to the uh, to, to, to to do part of their promise. And when you talk about uh, you know the issue of corruption, who fails to remember that some of his closest lieutenants, the likes of Chris Morongaro, they were embezzled out of state house. Reason being that there was something that pointed to them, uh, uh, Jeff. Mm -hmm. The the very fact that everybody knew. Ask him from from uh, Mutua, Governor Mutua. Everybody will tell you. Kibaki never brought deals. He never believed in deals. Everybody will tell you. Since he was a professor at Makerere, there's nothing you can pinpoint that Kibaki did. Many other probably you can say, hey, this thing does not sit pretty. Probably he may have Kibaki, he doesn't. So when you say things about corruption, is he believed people who could execute policies, but they failed to do it. But the man himself set himself apart, by the way, and history will forever judge him because of his power of doability. Jeff, you remember, I was telling somebody the other evening, many young people believed in our economy. For the first time, you saw people who never knew what a stock, ex what a stock was. Young people were lining up for IPOs. They believed in a country. And uh, Mark, that is all you need. You need somebody to come, not only with a buzzword, yeah, of Yote uh, or in Mefanyikana, you need somebody who <laughs> creates. <laughs> what you are talking about? You need somebody who creates hope, and I believe that's what Kibaki did. I think it's only sitting president or even leader who is going to court as a sitting president to respond to, you know, there's some... some yes, well, yes, 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 yes. Our current presidents or, you know, the leaders we've had wouldn't be able to do that. Now, would you say that our constitutional change around 2010-2011 is what has opened up the cracks for people to, you know, do their corrupt ways? Had we extended Kibaki's leadership, assuming there was no uh, term limit, <clears throat> to this time, how would Kenya be? be? And the question is, how different is Uhuru Kenyatta then to Mwai Kibaki? And the answer is, not quite different. And I'll tell you why. When Kibaki was leaving power, remember our debt to GDP ratio was around 52%. Today, our debt to GDP ratio is around 58%, plus COVID. Okay, because that's a huge thing. Yeah. You know, the world over, it's a huge thing. Mm. If you look at the track record of starting to build roads, 
you will find that Kibaki would have done the same thing. And someone would ask, why didn't Kibaki build more roads? It's simple. Kibaki inherited an economy which whose debt ceiling was zero. You could not borrow. After the, the, the term of the um, Salia Mudavadi as finance minister, the term of Moi as president, by the time you were getting into office in 2002, it was difficult to even pay your own salary as president. I, I think this country needs to learn to build on good. And the reason why I'm saying we need to build on good, there's a reason as to why the former U.S. President Bill Clinton, when asked who was the only person he would like to meet, which person, which personality would he like to meet, he goes in front of TVs and said, the person he would like to meet is Moiki Baki. Why Moiki Baki? Because of the free primary education. Mm -hmm. And what many didn't know, because that was the mantra that Kibaki came in when he was elected president. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even the economy. The economy was a plus. All right? But why free primary education? Because he understood one thing. No country, no country that is looking for self-respect in this world will become anything if their labor is not skilled, if their labor is not efficient. And I believe that's what Kibaki was building. What many people didn't understand is how do we continue building on good? I like the other day when uh, the president put a um, uh, multi-agency task force, and I actually happened to be part of that task force, of reclaiming school land. Hmm. And this was started way back by Kibaki. But why was he claiming school land? Because he understood that our institution needed to grow. As our population grow, grows, so does this institution. Because let me tell you, Jeff, there's a lot of mess. And when I say a lot, there's a lot because I've seen the data and I've been there. Some of the greatest acreages in some of our big institutions have actually shrunk. And it's not shrinking because of sheer, you know, uh, natural features, no. It's because of people hiving those acreages. A school that had 250 acres today probably stands at 150. Where did that acreage go? People have taken it, politicians have, you know. And so if you go, for instance, if you go to your alma mater in New York, Jeff, you'll get lost. You know why? Because they've built you know, the library that you left, you're told, ah, no, Jeff, that library, no, we build a big one. Mm -hmm. It shows you that these great nations believe in the extension of academic institutions. And so I think we need to learn to build on good. Where Kibaki left, any person coming in should learn to build on good. Where? President Uhuru lives, another person coming in must actually see between the differences and say, what works? What can I build on better? And what can I change? Because at the end of the day, it's changing policy, it's creating policy, it's having your own vision. But as long as you have something good that has actually been planted, that has a very strong foundation, build on it. This is how Lee Kuan Yew worked. This is how Chairman Mao worked. They did not come to invent the wheel. And this is something I think we Africans, mm. we, we need to learn something. Just because Jeff was president and took what when I come in, I really don't need to rub everything down to the ground. I can sit down and ask, hey, Jeff was able to do this, and it was good. He was able to fix uh, free primary education. How do we increase the allotment of money to free primary? Right now, it's 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 in tatters. There were a scandal or two during his mm. time, Mark. I mean, everybody has forgotten Anglo leasing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the elephant in the room. Now, if you want to know uh, when the tide shifted in the fight against corruption, it's Anglo leasing. Why was this where the tide shifted? Up to that point, the Kibaki administration had run uh, uh, scandal free. Mm. Okay? Now it had run scandal free for long enough. And then suddenly there was this Anglo leasing thing, which, by the way, did not start during Kibaki's time. Anglo leasing started in 1998. It was a contract uh, uh, that had to do with passport printing and things like that. Now, what happened was this that number one, in, in, in the Mudavadi uh, finance ministry, then there was a whole host of very funny contracts, uh, a host of them. By that, I mean, you know, you'd be told this road is supposed to be built, it will never be built, money was issued, no one was accountable and things like that. So any contract from back then had a lot of loopholes. Much of our borrowing has to happen commercially. This is why the debt during Uhuru's time is more expensive than the debt during Kibaki's time. Because Kibaki was leading a least developing country. This is probably why I would like us to judge Kibaki mm. on is what did he do? Three of his closest friends, when after the reshuffle of cabinet, the person we found missing was Chris Morongaro. Mm. He was not in the lineup. But something happened thereafter. Three of his friends, 
starting with Chris Murongaro, Muraria resigned because of Anglo leasing. And I would believe, actually, it's Kibagu said, by the way, I've led a very tight ship, non corrupt, you know, uh, your name has come up. And this, this is a beauty about working with somebody who is not tainted. They do not believe that the minute the finger of accusation points at you, you must leave, you know. And after more than after his friend left, the other great friend of his, Kiraito Murungi, thing of accusation pointed at him. What happened? He had to go. So to me, I am more concerned, what did he do? And probably that's where, to me, I'll engrave, you know, his name in the arc of history, that he just did not sit back and say, you know, let the court deal. No. You've been accused. Finger is on you. Please. And looking towards August, three, a little over three months away, I mean, should we expect much? Should we expect change? Or is it going to take another generation, another round of elections? Come August 2022, every scandal that William Buto has, that Raila Odinga has, is what will be visited upon you mm. every time. So if they have main scandals, land grabbing scandals, whatever, however much land Raila Odinga has stolen, multiply by a hundred. However much land William Ruto has stolen, multiply that by a hundred. Because if you are to follow Mwai Kibaki, a tiger does not change its stripes. If you want to look at the economic policy, what Raila Odinga was as Prime Minister, as Minister of Roads, ETC, is what he's going to continue to be. What William Ruto was as Minister of Agriculture, as Minister of Higher Education, and as Deputy President, even if he wants to say in the first five years of his Deputy Presidentship, it is what he is going to continue to be. So, Kenyans, let me prepare you. Stop believing in the hype that they are going to change your life. No, 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 no. They are going to do what they have done since 1992. Where YK92 was and where Raila Odinga was is what they are going to do. And I say that without any fear of contradiction. Because it was they were adults and they made a choice that when it comes to repealing section 2a and bringing back democracy mm -hmm. this is where i'm going to stand 2002 when it comes to bringing in president kibaki this is where i'm going to stand 2005 2007 where they stood is where they are today a tiger does not change its stripes. <laughs> so if you know Raila Odinga, you know what to expect. If you know where Western Hotel is, you know what to expect. <laughs> who they were is who they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, I think Jeff, with, with, the, with the three remaining months, yeah. in fact, it's not even three. I think it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's more or less 100 days. Um, I, I think what is left is for the current president to just steer the ship and ensure that there's peace, a very peaceful transition, because that marks also his presidency but after that what kind of legacies would he want to see happen or any person coming in and this is a good thing that i've heard from both leading contestants the contenders i've heard from ray loading and i've heard from william ruto they are saying the big four makes sense the big four makes sense jeff i will continue repeating this because you know i've really evangelized on the big four agenda these are the game changers that build many European countries. When you look at them, they are a set of very good ideas that need to be calibrated and need to be executed. We achieve just 70%, Nick, 70% of the Big Four agenda. We achieve 70%, I guarantee you, we will leapfrog from being a developed country, a developing country, to a developed country. Mm. I totally believe that. What's that saying again? They are who they were is who they are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>